Abend und hallo. Uh, my name is uh, Vanessa Domitzlaff. My full name is uh, Svantia Alexandra Vanessa Grace Hildegard Domitzlaff. So maybe that rolls easier off your tongue than uh, just Vanessa. But I am traditionally known as Nessie, to simplify matters. So uh, I do teach German at Indiana University in Bloomington and uh, yeah, before I begin, I would like to thank you for welcoming me here to speak to you today. Um, I am honestly just so impressed and touched to see all of the effort that uh, was put into creating a public forum that promotes learning and focuses on bringing together a diverse group of people such as us. I think tonight's event speaks for the high caliber of students this community has produced, and I'm really, really honored to share this experience with you tonight. Um, I have to be frank and honest, I am absolutely terrified to stand here before you. Um, I am a teacher, which seems strange to me, but just by being elevated by a foot I, and being above you, I feel really uncomfortable. And usually you'll find me amongst you, talking to you, with you, not really at you. And that's the part that makes me feel uncomfortable. But when my former student, Sarah Aziz, who's now one of my friends, I would like to say, uh, invited me to come to speak to you today, I could not say no. A student called me, I come. <laughs> so please bear with me. Uh, as an instructor, I try to be very engaging and empathetic towards my students. I try to understand the personal circumstances my students may find themselves in and then make myself fully available to them and support them as best as I can. I like to think that I have a very approachable demeanor. I smile a lot. Uh, I have an awkwardness about me that I think students like. Um, <laughs> so I, I really do hope and believe that my students actually feel uninhibited when talking to me, and that's very important to me. Uh, I try to connect with each one of my students on a personal level uh, through conversation. Uh, so that we can uh, establish a relationship of trust between each other. I think that's very important in, in an education. Um, I want my students to always feel invited to speak, uh, to ask questions, to contribute productively to class con uh, discussions. And I never want them to feel too intimidated to push beyond their comfort levels. Uh, yet I also like to challenge their views by forcing them to consider conflicting perspectives that are valid in their own right. As an educator, it is my main concern to create a conducive learning environment where students are permitted to make mistakes without the fear of being judged and experiment with new ideas without the fear of being dismissed. By creating a friendly, open-minded atmosphere, we can inspire students to undergo self-motivated change and help them become the person they desire to be. Uh, one of the common literary sources that I tend to draw from in my courses is actually the diary of Anne Frank. Um, I guess that many of you already know uh, at least a little bit of Anne Frank. Um, to condense it, I, she was a young German Jew who was forced into hiding in an attic uh, when the Nazis seized control of Germany in the 1930s. Unfortunately, she would not survive the war, and so this young, vibrant woman became one of the countless victims of the Holocaust. I believe that Anne Frank is one of the most incredible role models that I have ever encountered in my studies in German. As a young girl, I really responded to her. I always was struck by how, order, how her ordinary life did not cease to be when she went into hiding. Anne did not stop being the youngest member of her family, nor did she, be, stop be, nor did she stop being frustrated for not being taken seriously by the adults around her. And yet, despite an extra, extraordinary injustice being thrust upon her and navigating through her strained family relationship, she remained powerfully optimistic and developed a very sophisticated view of her experience. So please allow me to share an excerpt of her diary, which I think speaks for Anne's incredible principles and the immense personal growth she was able to experience in spite of her isolation. I think we can all draw inspiration from her truly insightful and wise words. On Tuesday, August 1st, 1944, only three days before her, she and her family would be discovered, Anne made her final journal entry. She confesses that she deeply desires to be a better version of herself, but that her fears of being judged inhibit her from changing. So in the words of Anne, 
I'm awfully scared that everyone who knows me as I always am will discover that I have another side, a finer, better side. I'm afraid they'll laugh at me, think I'm ridiculous and sentimental, not take me seriously. I'm used to not being taken seriously, but it's only the light-hearted Anne that's used to it and can bear it. The deeper Anne is too frail for it. Sometimes when I really compel the good Anne to take the stage for just a quarter of an hour, she simply shrivels up as soon as she has to speak and lets Anne number one take over. And before I realize it, she has disappeared. Therefore, the nice Anne is never present in company, has not appeared one single time so far, but almost always predominates when we're alone. I know exactly how I'd like to be, how I am too inside. But alas, I'm only like that for myself. And perhaps that's why, no, I'm sure it's the reason why I have got, why I say I've got a happy nature within, why other people think I've got a happy nature without. I'm guided by the pure and within, but outside I'm nothing but a frolicsome little goat who's broken loose. As I've already said, I never utter my feelings about anything, and that's how I've acquired the name of boy chaser, flirt, know-it-all, reader of love stories. The cheerful Anne laughs about it, gives cheeky answers, shrugs her shoulders indifferently, behaves as if she doesn't care, but oh dearie me, the quiet Anne's reactions are just the opposite. If I'm to be quite honest, then I must admit that it does hurt me that I try terribly hard to change myself, but that I'm always fighting against a more powerful enemy. A voice sobs within me, there you are, that's what's become of you. You're uncharitable, you look supercilious and peevish. People dislike you and all because you won't listen to the advice given to you by your own better half. Oh, I would like to listen, but it doesn't work. If I'm quite quiet and serious, everyone thinks it's a new comedy and then I have to get out of it by turning it into a joke. Not to mention my own family, who are sure to think I'm ill make me swallow pills for headaches and nerves, feel my neck and my head to see whether I'm running a temperature, ask me if I'm constipated and criticize me for being in a bad mood. I can't keep that up. If I'm washed to that extent, I start by getting snappy, then unhappy, and finally I twist my heart around again so that the bad is on the outside and the good is on the inside. And I keep on trying to find a way of becoming what I would like, so like to be and what I could be if there weren't any people living in this world. So incredibly, rather than concentrating on the unfair circumstances inflicted on her life, Anne focused on the changes, changes that she could inspire from within herself. As we re read Anne's diary and gain a sense of her life, we realize that she certainly did undergo a change in attitude and began to see herself and her family in a different light. While in hiding, Anne was able to finally develop a closer relationship to her sister Margot than the one they had shared before, even though Anne still resented her at times whenever they were compared to each other. Margot was the more agreeable child, but Anne learned that her frustration was misplaced. She initially held her sister responsible for the way her parents made her feel, but Anne learned to relate to her sister and bond with her in spite of their differences. Anne went on to write that Margot had changed too and became much nicer. She's not nearly as catty these days, she writes, and is becoming a real friend. She no longer thinks of me as a little baby who doesn't count. I believe that sis the sisters were finally communicating with empathy and came to respect each other's views. We get the sense that Anne finally felt validated for the first time and recognized by someone else who saw her the way she wanted to be seen as a sophisticated young woman. As nearly all teenagers, Anne struggled with the way people perceived her. She did not feel comfortable to share her feelings and resorted to her diary as an outlet for her feelings, where she felt safe to confide freely without the fear of being judged or dismissed by others. In her diary, Anne frequently confided that she had a difficult relationship with her mother. She initially struggled to articulate her feelings towards her and at times wrote emotionally charged and intentionally hurtful, hurtful words to describe her contempt for her mother's sarcasm and hard-heartedness. Anne was very sensitive to the style in which her mother communicated with her. But later, 
When Anne revised her diary, we learned that Anne has become more careful not to make sweeping generalizations. When she revisits her original entries, she actually feels remorse and shame for some of the things she had said. She became very critical of herself instead of seeking out someone else to blame. She admonishes herself and she seems to be disappointed with her lack of empathy. She writes, Anne, is it really you who mentioned hate? Oh, Anne, how could you? She realized that she allowed herself to flare about with her emotions and hurting and hurt people, uh, people's feeling around her. Uh, she accepted the responsibility of her <coughs> action and held herself accountable for having judged harshly and immaturely. Anne came to the realization by ways of her own logic that her mother suffered from her own anxieties in light of the family's circumstances. She became to understand that there were differences probably result Oh, excuse me, that their differences probably uh, resulted from misunderstanding caused by poor communication, and that she had added unnecessarily to her mother's suffering by being intentionally cruel. With this realization, Anne began to treat her mother with a degree and toler of tolerance and respect. I can't resist sharing, uh, sharing with you this uh, favorite passage of, passage of mine uh, from Anne's diary. In it, uh, and outlines to me the driving principles of life, uh, love, and the desire to become a better version of yourself. And if I can remind you, those are, of course, the driving principles of all of our enduring world religions, so that's something to consider. Um, in spite of the dark circumstances that overshadowed Anne's life, she would never lose hope in the common good. It's a wonder I haven't abandoned all my hopes my ideals. They seem so absurd and impractical. Yet I cling to them because I still believe, in spite of everything, that people are truly good at heart. It's utterly impossible for, impossible for me to build my life on a foundation of chaos, suffering, and death. I see the world being slowly transformed into a wilderness. I hear the approaching thunder that one day will destroy us too. I feel the suffering of millions. And yet, when I look up in the sky, I somehow feel that everything will change for the better, that the cruelty too shall end, and the, that peace and tranquility will return once more. So uh, I guess it would be better to conclude on a personal note, uh, or speak at least from my heart. I think Anne Frank has to be one of the most awe-inspiring personalities in history. This is a young girl, younger than any one of us in this room, who managed to formulate such a sophisticated view of the world from inside a little room in an attic. So I think we should all strive to be better people, um, but I think that requires a lot of collaboration. You, uh, opening up and, and allowing change to come in is, makes a person very vulnerable. And we need to not turn our backs on that person, but we need to really communicate and turn towards each other so that we can inspire change and, uh, um, yeah, and progress as a community. Um, I would like to close on one of uh, my favorite little stories. It's really short. Um, it's a short story by Berthold Brecht. Um, to me, this little short st story captures the ex exact attitude that we should all uh, strive for uh, and uh, uh, have towards personal change. So here goes the story. A man whom Mr. Koina had not seen for quite some time greeted him with the words, Wow, you haven't changed a bit. To which Mr. Koina responds, <gasps> and turned pale. <laughs> yeah. So bearing this little story in mind, I would like to say thank you and goodbye. And I hope that we never meet again as we are today. Thank you. Thank you.